You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. Our iconic Birdcage Walk building is 122 years old. And like many old structures, it's in need of extensive refurbishment and modernisation for the institution to continue to be able to use it and to make it fit for purpose for the next 122 years. In this episode, we will be discussing what lies ahead for our London-based home and why it's so important to our 120,000 members. One Birdcage Walk was opened in May 1899 as the institution's new HQ. In 1909, the institution bought Storiesgate Tavern, which along with an earlier purchase of 5 Princess Street, meant I'm a Key HQ could expand eastwards. In 1958, I'm a Key bought three Birdcage Walk and the two buildings were formally joined together in 1960. In recent years, Three Birdcage Walk has been used as offices for staff and tenants, while Birdcage One has been the home of our membership, with meeting rooms, our beautiful library and lecture theatre. Doing nothing to the building is not an option, as the work has now become urgent, and it has been estimated that to bring the building up to the standards expected of an international headquarters, it will cost around £16 million to complete. The Real Estate Strategy Group, the RESG, set up to identify possible ways forward, is headed by trustee Helena Rivers, whose expertise is in the heritage building sector. The group has looked at a number of options for the building and taken advice from a range of experts in the subject. RESG's strong recommendation is to sell a 250-year lease of three birdcage walk to provide funds to refurbish one birdcage walk and hopefully also generate a cash surplus. This proposal has the full backing of the Trustee Board, Finance Board, Audit and Risk Committee and Strategy Committee. In quarter three of 2020, the RESG undertook a limited consultation involving the Council, Young Members Board, Past Presidents and Trustee Board. Overall, there was similar feedback from each group. The survey found that 73% were in favour of retaining one birdcage walk and 27% against. Asked if HQ should be relocated, 54% favoured a headquarters in London versus 46% supporting regional hubs. These results showed a strong support for keeping our HQ at Birdcage Walk. But how does the rest of the membership feel about this? The consultation has now been widened to gain as much input from members as possible on this contentious decision. I spoke with Alice Bunn, I'm a key CEO, Helena Rivers, RESG Chair, Terry Spall, Past President, and David Noel, Trustee, to find out more about the proposed ideas and what a refurbishment of the building would offer to members here in the UK and overseas. I started by asking Alice about the kinds of issues the group had investigated in order to produce the proposal document. Thank you so much for joining me today on this special edition podcast. Alice, if I might start with you, obviously you've recently taken over as CEO of the Amaki, but you are first and foremost a member of the institution. So what do you think are the most important things to take account of as we approach this decision on the future of our HQ? Well, I guess, you know, fundamentally, um, the HQ has to fit in with our vision for the future. 
right? And happily, we've just set out <laughs> that vision, which is to be, you know, a world leading global and inclusive organization. And if you kind of, you know, break that down a little bit, I think, you know, world leading, um, it's fantastic that we're 175 years old next year. We've got lots to celebrate in our history, but we also have to make sure that, you know, the building becomes that beacon for the future, which is, I think, some of the really exciting bits of the proposal on the table at the moment. Um, you know, global, we need to really, really make Make sure that our HQ can speak to our international members as well as all of our members in the UK um, in a really, really inclusive way. And I think some of the facilities that we see in this proposal are really exciting because goodness me, we've all missed that opportunity to get together. We've all missed that opportunity to share ideas, to network. And I think, you know, that opportunity for continued professional development, for lifelong learning, upskilling, reskilling, is going to be so important in the future. So we need a home for that. So I would absolutely start with the vision. Of course, Whatever we put forward has to be uh, financially resilient as well. It has to be a sustainable solution for the future. Now, the building is 122 years old. It's, it's not looking too bad for its age, I suppose. But, but what are the biggest issues facing our super centenarian headquarters? The, I think the, one of the things that uh, is really an issue is, uh, is, is, is sort of invisible, and that's all the mechanical and electrical services. Yeah. And, of course, we would really uh, very much like the building to move into the 21st century by becoming much, much closer to carbon neutral. So there are opportunities there in replacing those services that uh, enable us to, to go for a low-carbon low local heat network, for example. Uh, we can put in uh, better and more environmentally friendly uh, services. We can make the building uh, fit for uh, the modern kind of age of hybrid working. And also there are basic things like the roof leaks and, uh, uh, and, and the windows need replacing, and uh, those are expensive jobs to do. And they need doing uh, in order to make the building fit for the next 125 years. Absolutely. It's very much about the, the whole structure of the building, really, and, and, and trying to create an environment that is, is fit for us all to be able to use. Yes, and I think it's also um, very important that we give the staff uh, the best environment that we can to work in. And actually... When you get out of the public areas of the building and you start to walk into the areas that the staff are using, yeah. you see just how uh, 19th century those areas are. Yeah. And that's not how we want to work uh, together with our staff to provide the best services for our membership. Yeah, I, I'd have to come in and agree there. Uh, you know, the other point that's relevant here is the fact that we've actually don't need all the pet space that we've got at the moment. So, you know, some of the staff quarters are, are getting pretty shabby, but also of the remaining bits of the building that we don't need anymore, we'll struggle to let them out anymore. So we're not getting that tenant's income because we need significant refurbishment before we can, you know, get the income from that spare space. Yeah, yeah. Now, a proposal document has already been produced by the Real Estate Strategy Group, which is available on the Amici website. And this kind of puts forward a number of recommendations for, for members to consider regarding the future of HQ. Could you just outline what those proposals are? Yeah, the key proposal is that we um, sell a long-term lease, and that's a 250-year leasehold on three Birdcage Walk, and we invest the uh, money that we get from that sale in upgrading one Birdcage Walk. And there's a number of works which are required to one Birdcage Walk, both the essential works to improve the um, facade of the building, to protect the building, um, and to improve the um, health and safety um, for both the building users and those who are walking adjacent to the building. But also we need to invest in the building services. Um, all the services within the building are um, uh, well beyond their original design life and need replacement. And as the charities moving forwards in line with the rest of the nation, we need to be upgrading the facilities in two fundamental ways. 
um, three fundamental ways, sorry. Um, one being around um, accessibility, ensuring that the facility is accessible to all our members. One being around digital connectivity. And then finally, um, in reducing our high operational carbon footprint that we have at the moment. So we have a, a number of uh, options that we've considered uh, as we've been through this process. I, I should add that the process has been running now for just over two years. Uh, so a lot of work has been done behind the scenes and uh, we've been sort of reaching out to the membership over the last year as well uh, to make them aware of the different scenarios that we have. We have looked at options involving disposal of part or even all of the, of the building. Um, also, how we could perhaps produce a solution where we could retain the whole of the building. Now, as uh, Alice mentioned, um, we don't actually need the whole building. It's roughly 65,000 square feet. Um, we need roughly half of it to completely uh, accommodate all of our envisaged membership activities and all of our staff activities. Um, so right. we don't need the whole building. So with that in mind, you know, we, we haven't left the building half empty, I should say, for, for the last few years. Um, <laughs> it's been let out to tenant companies. Um, we've been generating rent through that for the space we don't need. Uh, but what we're looking for now is, is a, a much cleverer solution that will allow us to generate uh, significant revenue uh, to be able to do a, properly, a proper refurbishment of, of one birdcage walk. Um, I, I mentioning one birdcage walk, I should, I should just mention, because we'll probably get onto this later on, is that the building is, is in two parts. It's one birdcage walk and three birdcage walk. Uh, the bit that you'll know as members is one birdcage walk, uh, which has got all of the member facilities in, bar a couple of meeting rooms. Um, and... Uh, all, all of the main sort of venues that you use when, 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 you, when you're being entertained at, or entertaining at the, at the facility. So we, uh, one birdcage walk is what we're focusing on. Three birdcage walk has been let out and used by staff and, and we could manage without it very, very easily. Um, so using that in a slightly smarter way, uh, we can generate revenue, uh, allow us to do a full, not just a refer, but actually significantly improve one birdcage walk uh, to address all the issues. You, you heard Alice mention about inclusion and things like that. You know, the building isn't very accessible if you're in a wheelchair. It's got all sorts of other yeah. issues as well, which we, you know, we can sort out as part of this uh, development now. So we have a great opportunity in front of us. Um, you know, and the, as I say, we have looked at other options as well. Uh, we have looked at maybe um, trying to raise finance on the building itself through a mortgage or similar uh, so we could retain the whole building and invest in it. But we, we've sort of steered away from that a little bit because it actually brings a lot more risk into the equation. And, of course, you know, yeah. we, we're not great risk takers. We don't want to take high levels of risk with the institution. I think you know, it's not, it doesn't sit well with our culture. Uh, and when you think that we don't actually need half the building, then it doesn't kind of make a lot of sense to do that. Um, you know, the other options of, of disposing of the asset, well, we tested it out on a lot of our, our active members and, and even the wider membership through various uh, calls for feedback. Um, and whilst there are a few who would like to sell the building and, and realise the asset value, um, the vast majority um, are very attached to the building and see it as a core part of what the IMAC is to them. And therefore, you know, we don't feel that we'd ever get close to a two-thirds majority to sell that. So we've not, we've not focused a lot of effort into that. We have looked at it. Um, we have a, a, an idea of what it, what it might be worth. But the reality of, of, of making that happen is... Um, is quite daunting and, and probably not, we don't feel anyway, not in the best interest of the institution at this time. So they're the sort of options sure. we've considered. Um, all of those are, are documented on our website. Uh, as a special, some special web pages that are dedicated to, to the, the, the building development. Excellent. Well, I will mention the, the website for, for our members to, to go and have a look at in a little while. But I, I guess one question would be, what happens if we do nothing about the building at all? Where will we be, as, as Alice said, in 122 years time if we just, just do nothing? Very wet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, one of the most pressing issues is to fix the roof. Um, you know, we need to do that regardless. But if I may, I was just going to add to Terry's answer, because when we looked at these options, I think what's important to convey is we didn't do this in isolation. Sure. We're fully aware sure. that we're not in a unique situation here. In fact, you quickly look round 
for instance, some of the other professional engineering institutions. And and most people have had their moments, right? Yeah. Uh, most people yeah. have, have been at a point where they've had to take a material decision on their headquarters. And, and that's been really helpful to us because we've been able to learn from them. Um, I would also say you have to be careful about drawing direct comparisons. So for instance, one of the things I hear quite a lot about is, you know, why don't you be like the Institute of Physics and, you know, sell this old building and move to somewhere new in London? Well, if you speak to the Institute of physics one of the big motivators was to get a freehold now we already have the freehold so i think you know we've definitely learned from the other peis in drawing up these options but you also have to be a little bit cautious about drawing direct comparisons yeah that i think that's a fair comment i think it you, you know you you need to learn from all of those experiences and we, our, our sister institutions have, have gone through similar similar things to us haven't they so so there's there's lots of information out there that that you've been able to draw on to to give you a a robust uh, idea of what needs to to be done which is great now if we consider the the full re- refurbishment option for a moment this whole process is going to to cost the institution a great deal of money and and it's certainly going to take an incredible amount of time to complete so can the institution afford this kind of investment and and what upheaval do you think it might bring to uh, to the 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 staff and and also to the members yeah, I mean, we get um, quite rightly, we get lots and lots of questions about the um, financial analysis and the rigour with which we've approached this exercise. And, you know, I think the first message is that we've been very conservative, actually, in the approach we've taken around finances. So uh, the costs, for instance, have a he- very high level of contingency built into them. Um, the estimates for what we might get at the sale of the leasehold um, are, are very moderate. Um, so, Uh, That's an important message. It's also important that we think this is one of the reasons we think this is a is a good solution is that we're not going to have to um, dip into our free reserves. Um, So it's a neat solution in that sense, because um, we can finance the refurbishment of the modernisation and are left with a building that's fit for purpose. Um, that suits our needs, is right size for our needs, and also should be able to draw in a higher income because the venue facilities will be of a much greater standard than they are today. Uh, And the third point is, and we get this too, is the costs of the refurbishment and modernisation won't be met through any subscription increases. Um, So the, the approach, I would say, has been very conservative from a financial point of view. It is absolutely imperative that whatever proposal is on the is on the member vote is financially sustainable for the long term and we've been looking at that very closely as soon as we identified the option of um releasing the leasehold on three bird cage walk and investing the funds from that um to upgrade one bird cage walk we've been working with various organizations to understand both the uh return we might get for selling that leasehold and also what the costs might be for delivering the project. And that's why you'll see um, on the website, there are relatively detailed design proposals um, for the works that we want to do to One Bear Cage Walk. Um, And we had to progress them to that um, degree of detail to get a proper cost plan um, so that we can understand that the uh, financial case does stack up. We've incorporated a lot of contingency within the financial plan. We've undertaken some different scenario plannings because the biggest unknown with this um, is what the what the cash return is going to be from that sale of the leasehold. Um, it is important to understand there are many gateways um, ahead of us in this project. And in the event that we get member support to proceed with a project, we still wouldn't proceed with a project if we don't get the um cash return that we believe three bird cage walk is worth and which we need um to enable us to progress with the project um so so yes is it an is it affordable yes the modeling that we've undertaken shows the project to be affordable including all of the project contingencies um which we've we've allowed within that model um and um we anticipate that there will be surplus cash the quantum of that surplus cash is very much dependent on that sale price um, and any surplus pr- cash that there is um, will be um, managed by the finance board in the normal way in which we um, manage the institution's finances. 
Um, and just to, regarding the governance around this, the scenario planning that's been undertaken has been done in conjunction with the finance board as part of the um, the project governance process um, to ensure that we have a viable proposal to bring to membership. Um, the second half of your question around um, the upheaval, um, as we've mentioned in some of the communications, Three Birdcage Walk is largely currently used by um, staff and um, outside organisations who lease, lease the space. However, to do the works that we're proposing to do, we need to vacate the full, the full building. And that's largely due to the fact that we need to upgrade all of the building services and IT infrastructure. So there is major upheaval for the institution. Um, the proposals uh, for the staff during this period is a combination of um, working from home, as all the staff have been doing throughout the pandemic, um, and also uh, renting some office space within London to ensure that there is still the opportunity for collaboration. And for those people who don't enjoy working from home to be able to work within that office environment. Um, for continuity of member services, again, we will be um, renting space um, on a much more ad hoc basis to ensure that we've got the uh, space and facilities to enable us to keep member activities uh, rolling on um, just as we would if we still had Birdcage Walk. Yes, and, and indeed, you, you mentioned, Terry, about the, the consultation with members as well, you know, to find out what they felt. What, what has, has been the general consensus? You, you mentioned that they're very attached to the building, but what's been the general consensus so far from, from the surveys you've done? It, to be honest, it's been really interesting to, to talk to members about this. Um, there's a lot of interest. And whilst I was president last year, I took the opportunity to speak to pretty much all of our, our regional committees all around the world about this particular subject and get their view on it. And, you know, there is a lot of passion out there that, uh, that this is part of what the AMACI is and you want to make sure that we take the right decision because it's probably the biggest decision the institution is going to take for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, so we need to make sure we get it right. And, and people want information. They want to know uh, exactly what's going on behind the scenes. And, and, you know, we're trying to be as open as we possibly can in providing information. So we had a, an ongoing uh, Q&A activity uh, through the website so when everybody's raised a question they've always got an answer to it and we've tried to be as open as we can in providing that information uh, so it's really I think confidence is building you know we, we want to do it right we want to consult properly uh, and you think we've been in this process of consultation now for well it started with a PE article professional engineering article that I did in March this year uh, so we've been at it quite quite a period of time now, and it, it's got a bit more m bit more to go yet. So you've still got time to uh, to make your contribution. Um, but once people understand the rationale and we explain it to them, um, my experience is that people are very supportive of the direction. We have some who have different views, um, and absolutely that's fine. You know, we really want that. We don't want everybody to think the same. We want to hear what people genuinely think, and you know, we can discuss it and, and see if it's uh, a sensible proposal. But what I'm seeing is a conversion now towards the um, the main proposal that we have, which is the, uh, the lease of three birdcage walk to create a much, much better one birdcage walk. Uh, so I, I'm quite pleased actually with the engagement we've had from members. It's been substantial. I mean, it's probably the biggest member consultation I've been involved with in all my years at the institution. I can't think of anything else that's been as widely consulted as this so far. Yeah, absolutely. And and the amount of information that's on the website, and I, as I said before, we'll, we'll come to that uh, a little later on, but the amount of information that, that's been made available is, is pretty substantial. You guys have been very busy producing all of that and spending an awful lot of time creating the financial analysis and, and looking at the, the construction side of things and everything else. I mean, you must have been spending an awful lot of your, your time doing that. Uh, it, that's very true, Helena, but we've not, obviously we've not been doing it ourselves. We've had to get experts in who, who work in this particular sector. So we, we've had uh, various organisations supporting us in this process uh, to make sure that we get the professional guidance that we, that we need in this area. We're very fortunate in that we do have uh, people who work in, in um in this sector in building building services and, and we can call upon their skills as members as volunteers if you like to help us uh, but alongside that we are taking a lot of professional advice to make sure that we uh, we, we have a document trail there that's robust and yeah. you know, the decisions that we get to are well well researched and, and properly understood and i think you know just to add on the consultation piece in this day and age it is um it is quite challenging sometimes to know uh, where the majority view lies, because 
uh, you know, you, you get a lot of voices. There's a lot of passion around the subject, which, as Terry says, is great. You know, we want people to tell us what they feel. So I think we are still in the middle of the consultation. I think it's highly likely that we're going to have to do something um, really rather rigorous to reassure ourselves on the cusp of putting this very big decision to the member vote, um, that we do have a proposal on the table which is meeting the majority of the membership's um, preferences. And I think, you know, to my mind, no effort is wasted in that endeavour because, you know, we hope the majority of the people will be happy, but the majority of people will need to be happy if we get the two thirds vote. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, d disagreement is is a fact of life. But what our duty is to make sure that we've allowed the opportunity for consult consultation and that we've made sure that we've listened to all the membership before we have then looked at that in its entirety and put forward the leading proposal. I think Alice makes a good point as well that our constitution requires us through the bylaws to get a two-thirds majority vote if we want to mortgage the building, if we want to sell a lease on number three uh, uh, or, or indeed if we want to sell the whole site. So we need a two-thirds majority of those members who vote in order to be able to do anything uh, uh, effective to move forward. And uh, there may well be 150,000 different opinions <laughs> amongst our membership as to what we do exactly we do uh, with the building. But we are going to have to come together and find a solution that works best for the institution and which people can get behind. And uh, what we've tried to do is bear that in mind throughout the whole process. So we've tried to strike a compromise here between those range of different views and we've tried to find a compromise which we believe will get support and will uh, satisfy the majority of the membership. It won't completely satisfy them and it certainly won't satisfy everybody. But uh, this is a, a, a really sound proposal that we hope that the membership can get behind. Yeah, totally, David. I think I think that's a very good point to make. We have on this show uh, a lot of international members who, who listen to eye to eye podcasts, uh, and many of them will have never visited London, let alone visited HQ in their working lives. So why should uh, our international colleagues be concerned about this refurbishment and what effect may it have on them? That's a great question, um, and I think it has um, a lot of different answers. Um, I think I think the first is um, the reason why so many international members join the the IMECE is um, in no small part the prestige associated um, with the historic institution, and part of that prestige um, is tied up with our headquarters, um, and the image of the institution is also tied up with the headquarters. Um, there are some challenges in association with that, in that it's not a modern uh, building right now, um, but it will be a much more uh, modern building if if this project goes ahead and we're able to implement the the improvements that we're recommending. Um, and so that prestige factor, I think, is really important. Um, I think the, the second element is um, enabling us to keep our headquarters in Win Westminster is a real enable enabler for us to um, influence government, to interact with um, policy makers and decision makers, um, which will impact not just the um, the projects and structure within the UK, um, but around the world also. Um, um, thirdly, um, the key one of the many key elements of the project is improving the digital connectivity um, of the building and uh, one of the things I think most people are struggling with right now is we all found ways of working when everyone was remote um, but now we've gone to this hybrid world it's much more challenging and one of the key outcomes of the project will be to create environments which make those people who are joining uh, virtually um, just as engaged as those people who are in the room. Um, we're conscious this is a real challenge, um, but a challenge that we're absolutely embracing. Um, and then finally, um, we hope that one day you will have the opportunity to um, visit the headquarters. Um, and if you are visiting the headquarters, the chances are if you're visiting the UK, you'll be coming into London. And there's a much greater chance of your being able to visit the headquarters if we um, keep our location within uh, London, um, being as it is the transport hub of the UK. I think there's some good things here, actually. 
I mean, first of all, it's going to make the building much more interactive so that it's going to be properly equipped for hybrid style meetings. And we've already seen through uh, Zoom and Teams that uh, international members are interacting much, much more often, much better with the main institution activities. Of course, there is a school of thought that says, well, you go completely online. But as, as we pointed out earlier, it's uh, really nice to also to get together and to talk to each other. And I think the new facilities will allow international members to be part of that. And we, we need to kind of be creative in what we do to enable them to participate in, in the headquarters. And who knows what's going to come along? I mean, maybe they'll all just turn up as, as telepresence robots and, uh, you know, we'll wander around and, and chat to each other in the marble hall. And, and, that, and that would be great. Uh, that would be great. I think the other thing is it's going to give uh, the staff really good working facilities. So the staff are going to be able to serve the membership much more effectively and much better. And uh, it's going to give a really uh, first class environment for all sorts of different institution activities to take place that can then be broadcast using uh, modern technology around the world. Uh, I, I totally agree, David. And in fact, we, we've seen just, just over the last few years with, with COVID, the, the amount of change in terms of the way that we interact. And I think it's actually brought the international community together. Um, and um, and now the, the events team are starting to do blended events where people are present in the room, but they're also able to dial in. And and I think, you know, that just shows us what we're going to be able to do with, with HQ in the future. So for me, I'm very excited about that kind of outlook and, and to see what we could do. Yeah, I think just to add to that, Helen, I think we're very fortunate in that we're now looking at this in a post-COVID world. I would hate to have been in a situation where we kind of set it all in, in concrete and, and, and started the project and then had to en endure yeah. COVID and then had to try and work back into the building design, the changes that the building would need in the future. You know, we are in a very fortuitous position. And like yourself, I, I see it as a great opportunity. I'm sure we're going to talk about many of the benefits as we as we go through the rest of the uh, podcast. But there are some very significant benefits to be realised, which makes the project really, really exciting, I think. Really. It's really it's a, such a great opportunity to make a massive change to, to how, how we operate as an institution. Yeah, I think that point on timing is really, really important as well, because it is right that we've seen a more... Um, inclusive way of working because we have been able to really bring our you know international members into the room as it were and I think now we do have the opportunity to make sure that during the free refurb those rooms are kitted out to be absolutely best in the class to support hybrid working um, but we also know as a result of the last couple of months in particular that there is a genuine appetite for people to physically get back together again you know we're seeing absolutely record levels of booking requests um, because you know the world is opening up again so if we get this right there's a brilliant sweet spot to be had here yeah totally and and I'm 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 one of those people who is desperate to get back in the room with uh, with my committee members, with the biomedical committee, just to just to be there with them and and uh, and bounce ideas off them. It's, it makes such a difference, and and that brings us nicely, I think, there, Alice, to to what the future might look like. Now, I, I thought I'd I'd ask a bit more about the vision statement, which is is all about securing the future for HQ, and I, I'm going to break this down into three parts because it is quite a long statement that that's been put together. So I wanted to start with the first part, which focuses on creating a modern, inspiring headquarters, which allows us to maximise our impact on government and society at large. So what kind of facilities and services do you envisage being available to members and, and how will this improve our impact as an engineering thought leadership? I mean, I think we're going to have some fantastic spaces. Uh, you know, one of the, uh, uh, of the elements of the proposal is to change the lecture theatre from its existing form, which is a rather formal lecture theatre, into a flexible space that we can use for a lecture theatre, but we can also retract the seating, we can use it for exhibitions, we can use it for events to get, say, school children in. We're going to have a an exhibition space as you first come into the building so again we can get people into the building we can really show them the best of engineering the building itself is going to be as terry said far more accessible so wheelchair accessible lift to every floor 
there will be a members lounge next to the library where members can meet and discuss informally over a cup of coffee and uh, we hope also that there will be a roof terrace which will be a great space for uh, you know having a glass of wine and looking out over, over the park so at the end of a hard day uh, thinking about uh, biomedical engineering or whatever else it is so I think there's going to be some really really super spaces which we can use flexibly as uh, things evolve and as our ideas evolve uh, to meet the needs of the institution and of society at large. I think um, I think there's so much impact to be realised, I really do, and I'm really excited by the strategy work and the conclusion that we should really focus our efforts around those four key policy priorities, so around climate and sustainability, around future transport, around infectious disease control, around education, and I think already we're seeing that through brigading our efforts we're going to be more impactful. So we've already got ideas of where we can more systematically channel our advice into government on their delivery of, of major programmes. Um, we've got some real excitement, I think, around climate and sustainability in particular, like managing that energy transition. Where we are, we will be able to very effectively work with other, other PEIs working in that space too, as well as influence government policy. And we've already had a couple of, um, you know, MPs come into the building and, and start some discussions in that area. Now, I do recognise that not all those policies need to be led by West Westminster, and we will obviously be engaging internationally and indeed um, other countries across the UK but there is a real opportunity there if we choose to take it. Well, I, I, I think you're, you're totally right and it gets me very excited, Alice, actually, to, to think that we could showcase all of those uh, strategic objectives within the just within the building itself and, and I think that, to me, sounds incredibly exciting for the future. Yeah, I mean, just to uh, add my thoughts to that, I think the... The, it gives us the opportunity as well to be a proper sort of technology showcase as well, you know, to be able to to you know to showcase through exhibitions or displays or whatever, you know, the really exciting future technologies that our our members, our engineers, uh, are involved with, uh, and the companies that they work for. They bring us much you know, associated much closer with where we should be at, at the front end of technology. Yes, it's nice to have the the heritage uh, and, and the steam engines and all the rest of it. That's great. You know, and it'd be nice to have that and retain it. But you know, what we really should focus on, and we want to really project our image, is really about future technologies. Um, the building itself could be a showcase if we if we get the, get it right in the way we want to do it. So a lot of the technologies that allow us to be low carbon. Uh, could be open and accessible to our members and influenced by our members as well. Well, it, it, certainly there are buildings uh, in London that demonstrate quite well the the mix of, of old and contemporary design that can come together to, to really create a, a working space. So, you know, I think I think those opportunities are there ju just as much for, for our building as they've been demonstrated in, in other buildings. Now, David, you, you touched briefly there on, on accessibility and I guess the second second part really of the vision statement is to create a building which is welcoming to our members and to the public uh, and be accessible to all and now it has been the case we we all know that the, the building has not always been the most access friendly so what kind of changes do you envisage being made to to enable not just our members to be able to come and use the building but but for us to to be able to invite the general public and and to create a STEM agenda within the building? So great question with a very broad answer. Um, so first of all, to address the accessibility of the, the building, um, at the moment, um, most members wouldn't be aware, but the uh, wheelchair access to the building um, is really challenging. Um, and it's via three birdcage walk and the lower ground floor. And it's not giving all of... Uh, our visitors the same experience of the building. So item number one, we want to address that. Um, and that is via a uh, ramp at the front of the building, which will um, finish adjacent to a new door located immediately to the left of the main entrance door so that everybody is coming into the building in the same location and having the same interaction um, with that space. Um, the next major change is the introduction of a new lift, um, which will connect all the way from the basement right up to the uh, roof space, which again gives all members access to 
all areas, sorry, not just all members, all building visitors access to all areas. Um, there are some challenges around um, some split different heights in floor levels um, around the building. Um, and for each of those, um, we have introduced um, a ramp solutions and um, with one exception where there is an additional um, small lift to manage that um, that level change. Um, so that gives everybody access to the building. However, at the moment, the feedback that we were receiving from members is that they might walk past the building, they might feel proud of the building, but actually at the moment they don't feel invited into the building. One of the key changes that we're undertaking to address that challenge um, is to really change the feel of the reception area. At the moment, it feels very prestigious. It feels very historic and um, full of our heritage, um, but maybe not so welcoming. So two of the major changes that we're undertaking there are introducing exhibition space. Um, that will be both for our um, physical um, artifacts, whether they are um, the cutting edge latest technology um, within engineering or whether they are representing our heritage. We will also have um, screens um, showing uh, videos of the latest activities um, which are being undertaken. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is widen the door to ensure that we can get in a formula student car. Um, so we're making it a much more interesting space to visit. And to support that, we're also introducing um, cafe style seating so that you can come in, have a quick chat, um, talk to fellow members, but equally bring your family in. It's an open environment in that reception area. Um, how are we going to bring in um, uh, people outside of the membership community, though, and enable them to engage with um, mechanical engineering, which is, after all, our um, charitable aim? Um, one of the key changes that we're looking to make in the lower ground floor is opening up of that great facility, which is the marble hall and the adjacent dining area, um, into a much larger integrated space. And we see that as being a a key space, yes, for um, exhibitions, um, yes, for conferences, but also for STEM engagement activities. Um, to have that that space where um, activities can be set up, um, people can uh, wander around um, and, and, and be emerged um, in some of the most exciting elements of mechanical engineering. One of the interesting things that we've done is uh, there are some um, historic features which need to move as part of, um, you know, on the gro lower ground floor, removing these walls. Um, and that includes relocating a historic fireplace. But we're not going to dispose of it. We will relocate it to preserve the heritage. You know, we're very proud of the building and we're proud of what it stands for. Um, so whilst we're trying to modernise and change the image, we will certainly be protecting the heritage as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, but no, in terms of attracting people in, I think, the vision is very much to uh, make that space when you come in as a, a showcase, uh, something that can really uh, start to excite people about the challenges of the 21st century and what mechanical engineers are doing to help address those challenges. And it will uh, allow us to really get people excited about, about what those uh, solutions are likely to look like. So I, I think we've got a tremendous opportunity and we, we have to remember, you know, where the building is, is a terrific asset. Uh, the, the sort of footfall in that in that area of London is huge and is going to continue to be huge. And if we can get only a fraction of those people just to look inside the building and see what's going on, we, we, we've, we've got a tremendous opportunity. Yeah, indeed. The I'm a Key has been very vocal during the COP26 event and indeed has had a long history of policy development on climate-related themes. So it was great to see the, the third part of the vision uh, is to be sustainable uh, in the long term with lower operational carbon. How are we going to turn our Victorian building into a 21st century sustainable centre of engineering excellence? It's a challenge, um, <laughs> uh, but 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 it, uh, it's a, you know we're engineers. We like challenges. Absolutely. 
So historic buildings are notably hard to um, make low carbon. But the key challenge that we're facing within the UK right now um, is the use of gas and the uh, carbon factor in association with the use of gas. So one of the things that we'll be doing will be entirely eliminating um, gas. And there are two options on the table around how we do that. Um, the first option, which will be um, entirely contained within the building, will be the use of air source heat pumps um, to provide our main source of heating and indeed any cooling that we need. The second option is that we integrate the building into the um, Westminster heat network. Now, that heat network is already in existence um, and gets as close as three buildings away from us. Um, so it's entirely possible. At the moment, though, the heat network um, is uh, run from a gas powered um, combined heat and power system. There are plans in place right now to decarbonize that heat network. Um, and the intention is that that would happen in a similar time frame to our project. Um, so in the event that that uh, project is successful, then we would like to integrate into that heat network and are engaging with the designers um, of that heat network. In the event that those timescales don't meet our own requirements, then we will um, use air source heat pumps as our primary source of heating and cooling. The other elements that we'll be undertaking is a lot to, to do with um, uh, smart use of data. So we are going to be ensuring that we are only heating, cooling and lighting spaces when they need it. Um, we will have presence detector, we'll have air quality detectors, which will um, control our, our lighting, all of which will be LEDs, um, and our ventilation rates and our temperatures. We'll also, as a result of in, um, replacing all of our windows, be massively improving the draft proofing of the building um, so that we can control our ventilation rates and we'll be improving the thermal performance of the building so that we won't be losing so much heat out of the windows. We'll also be controlling um, our solar gains so that those um, rooms which are at the moment really susceptible to overheating um, um, aren't exposed in the same way. Um, and therefore, we can create a much more comfortable temperature for everybody whilst reducing our operational energy. And I think it's just going to be a tremendous uh, demonstrator because if we're going to make zero carbon, that means everywhere is going to have to be zero carbon. No exceptions. And, and buildings like this are going to be a challenge. And, and we've got a fantastic opportunity here to uh, show what mechanical engineers can do. Mm, exactly. I mean, there's two sides of the opportunity, isn't there? I think one, we have a, uh, a responsibility to make sure that our own operations are managed in the most sustainable way. And I think there the, really, the ambition is to be, you know, best in class for a heritage building in sustainable operations. But the second is back to the tech, right? The second is back to us using the building to demonstrate that technology, which will provide the answers for the future. So not to steal someone else's phrase, but, you know, no more blah, blah, blah. This is this is what we do. This is this is how we actually um, move towards sustainable operations and sustainable living. I think that is definitely the approach. And I, I'm quite excited about having the roof garden. I, I'm now considering the, you know, the nice glass of wine on the roof. No, or maybe I shouldn't go there. <laughs> but the idea of having a, a roof garden where we can, we can actually be planting and, and various things that we can be putting back into the environment, I think is, is also a fantastic opportunity too. So yeah, definitely. Um, before we finish... I, I kind of wanted to get a word from each of you, really, as to to why you're so passionate uh, about our I'm a key home. W wherever it is, you know, making sure that it's fit for purpose and ready for the next generation of engineers. What makes you so passionate about that? Oh, shall I go? Yeah, wow. Quite simply, relevance. I am absolutely firmly of the view that we are more relevant today than we were 175 years ago. I think the challenges of the future will require an innovation that is beyond our comprehension. So what do we need to do? We just need to put the right frameworks in place. We need to put the opportunity for sharing ideas, for networking, for upskilling, for reskilling, you know, and the for bringing academia and industry together, you know, the really key ingredients of innovation. So I firmly, this is what makes me so excited. <laughs> I think, you know, we are sitting on top of a massive societal contribution if we can get this right. And, you know, 
we need a headquarters to do that. We need a headquarters that enables us to both physically come together and to be maximally inclusive and hold virtual events as well. And the timing is right now. I'd like to uh, do two things, really, with the headquarters. I'd very much like to use it as that showcase to address the challenges of the 21st century, which are huge. And, you know, I say to the students when I talk to them, uh, my generation's made a, a, a big mess of things, and it's for your generation to clear it up, you know, but the, there are huge challenges for our society and for, for uh, societies globally. And then I want to celebrate our past. Because our past also shows how engineers have made incredible contributions to uh, society over the last 125 years and have absolutely transformed our ways of life. And uh, we can do it again. Uh, it's a continuous process. So I want to celebrate that past and I want to excite people about it. I would it. like to see us realise the opportunity. I think we are looking at a fantastic opportunity here. Um, I, I've been involved with the building project uh, since 2014, actually, seven years. Um, and over that time, I've heard so many members talk about its shortcomings and things they would like to see and, and what they would like to get as, from the member experience. And what I see now is a solution that allows us to deliver the vast majority of that and satisfy those requirements. So we do have a great opportunity. Um, it's coming at the right time in a post-COVID world. Um, you know, we could have a significantly improved building that, our members will be proud of and we're proud to say that's that's my institution um, take their colleagues in um, and give them a cup of coffee and have a chat to them and, and, and socialize and go to the events that will hold a much more inclusive building so i had one gentleman who's a wheelchair who who, who rang me up and, and complained he couldn't get in the building and we can now solve that problem as well uh you know and for our international members you know in a, in a post-covid world now we can have proper hybrid meetings as david said uh, we can get on our journey towards net zero with the building. There are so many opportunities now. It, it just makes it so exciting. And I think, um, you know, I, well, I, I really hope we can get members behind this now to see it for themselves, understand the opportunity, and to see that you know the, a lot of work's gone in behind the scenes now to, to really reduce the risk for the institution uh, to an acceptable level. We're not, we're not in the game of taking big risks. Um, that's not what we're about. But you know, to see a situation where we understand the cost base uh, you know, we've thought about the contingencies, we understand the risks, um, we understand what the opportunity is on the market for, for the building itself. It all works. It all comes together in a proposal that's very deliverable, and that really gets me excited now. So I really hope we can get uh, our, our members behind it and allow us to take it forward. Um, so I am very proud of our headquarters building, um, and now I uh, live and work in the southeast, and I have the opportunity to visit the building frequently. But I was equally proud of our headquarters building when I lived and worked in the northwest and had never visited it, but I'd seen the image of uh, Birdcage Walk in all, in all of the documentation and thought, "Wow, what an amazing headquarters for, for us to have!" Um, so I want to protect that, and I want future engineers to feel that same element of pride um, at having such a prestigious headquarters. But I also want to make the building accessible to all of our members. I've, I feel really sad that we've not been able to achieve that before now due to the um, constraints associated with the heritage building. But this is our great opportunity to make that happen. And um, partly due to my day job, I really want to make sure that we can um, overcome the existing situation we have with such a high operational carbon footprint and really showcase the best in engineering within our own building and make it a living learning tool. Absolutely. I've always said that um, I've always felt that the, the membership of the institution is my family, but HQ is always my home. And that for me has always been something that has been very close to my heart. So maybe I'm slightly biased, but, um, but yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what the members decide, uh, where we go next and, and what the future holds for, for our institution. It's going to be very exciting, whatever happens. So, Alice, finally, if I might come to you, 
What can members do to find out more about the proposals, about the future plans? Um, and what are the next steps in the process? Yeah, so um, uh, this is a bit tricky, isn't it? Because we're in the middle of the consultation. And because we are in the middle of the consultation, I can't prescribe the next steps. Because <laughs> if I did, that wouldn't be sincere. Um, as I say, I don't think any time is wasted in making sure that we really have turned over every stone and made sure that we have done as much as possible to reach out into the membership and really, really listen to their views. Uh, it, it's not a quick process. Um, it, it's quite possible that we might end up, um, if you like, in some kind of interim step, conducting a ballot to be able to then, you know, look ourselves in the eye and say, we do have the proposal here that has the majority support before we go to a member vote. But I would leave you just by saying, um, please, please check it out yourself. There is a lot of information on the website. We are a completely open door. You know, you can contact me at any point. We've got a dedicated um, email address, birdcagewalker, I'm a key .org. Um, So the opportunities are absolutely there. And if anyone has any queries that there aren't already been covered in the extensive consultation to date, we are more than happy to um, pick those up and address those too. That's great, Alice. And, and we will put all of that information uh, onto the podcast feed. And obviously, some of those links may be uh, for members only, or they may be in the members area and you might need to log in first before you can access them. But those that are uh, sort of generally open to to members, you can go directly to the iMeki website, can't you? And and there's a, there's a page there that you can click on and it takes you through to all the various consultation documents. But we'll, we'll also put that email up as well, Alice, to make sure that people can get in contact as well. Great. Well, Thank you so much for joining me today. I know you've taken uh, a lot of time out of your your busy days, but uh, it's been great to listen to what you have to say. And I, I'm, I don't know about the members who are listening to the show today, but I'm very excited to see what happens next. And, uh, you know, keep all that information coming through because it, it's really helping us as members to, to make a decision. So thanks for joining me. That's all for this month. And indeed, for this year, we will be back again in January 2022 with some great new content. So it just remains for me to say, from all of us here at Impulse to Innovation, thank you for listening this year. Have a great holiday wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again in January. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you, so if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes.